and I'm the feminist. <laughs> I am also the Shelby White and Leon Levy director of the Broken Museum, ninth weekend, and I couldn't be more excited to welcome all of you to our annual Women in the Arts Luncheon. Thank you for being here. So um, many of you know that for over um, the nearly 200 years since our founding, the Brooklyn Museum could be defined by four adjectives. Actually, it could be defined by many adjectives. But for the purpose of today, I call them the four C's. Cutting edge, commitment, courage, and chutzpah. <laughs> we are in Brooklyn after all. The four C's are, are exemplified in the work of the Elizabeth A. Sacker Center for Feminist Art. It's the first of its kind in the nation and probably, in all likelihood, in the world. And the center is committed to showing and supporting cutting edge women artists. And it is with courage and chutzpah that we also work toward women's equality. And it is because of all of you who are here with us today that we have been able to show literally thousands of artworks by women and men through a feminist lens, and we presented hundreds of public programs that take on the big issues of our day, from uh, incarceration of women in the United States, to the education of our girls around the globe, to issues of human trafficking. And why are we doing this? It's because we believe that culture leads social change. And that means that culture precedes policy and political change. So we're keeping our gaze focused on issues of women's equality. And we have to do this. After all, until there are equal rights for women, our work will not be done here at the Brooklyn Museum. Marina Abramovich exemplifies all that we hold dear and true at the Brooklyn Museum. Throughout her career, she has been a courageous trailblazer, disrupting dominant narratives and the status quo. And I want to thank my dear friend Marina, if she can hear me from behind there, for the love and goodness that she brings to the world and into our lives. It is de deeply felt by many of us. So we applaud Marina today. Now, this special day would not be possible without Marina, but it also wouldn't be possible without some very special friends. And I want to particularly have you join me in thanking our incredible co-chairs, our trustee and the Center for Feminine Arts uh, Council member, Leslie Booth. Leslie, where are you? Stand up, Leslie. As well as our CFA member, Carol Robinson. Carol, where'd you go? Carol, stand up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there, I have glasses for a reason, Carol. <laughs> um, and I also want to acknowledge um, that they helped raise more money for this event than ever in its history before. And I also want to thank everyone on the Council for Feminist Art and this year's Benefit Committee for their enthusiasm and their generosity. And I thank our devoted board, in particular our board chair, Elizabeth A. Sather, who we meet momentarily. President Stephanie Ingracia. Thank you, Stephanie. That together they have all, all of you have set a new record for this event, raising nearly $200,000. But our goal is to raise $200,000. So I'd love to see um, at the end of the day for us to get to our final goal. So if you're a guest and have not contributed, I hope you will consider doing so. And believe me, you won't regret it. You'll be so proud of the exhibitions and the programs that you help to support. And you'll also help us at the museum build a movement for cultural change. In fact, all you have to do is look at our Zanella Maholi exhibition at the Sackler Center. It was set to close last week, but we decided to extend it just for you. And actually, uh, I found out this morning that the show is so popular that somebody climbed the facade of the museum last night and stole our banner. <laughs> Talk about success. <laughs> and all you have to do is see that, that show to also understand how arts contribute to greater understanding and love and empathy in the world. Now, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to our board chair and the founder of our center, Elizabeth Sackler. Thank you. Thank you. 
everyone. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's delightful to have you here, and welcome, Anne, to our Women in the Arts Luncheon. This is actually our 13th annual Women in the Arts Luncheon, and the Sackler Center opened in 2007, so we're just coming into our ninth year. The reason we have 13 Sackler uh, Women in the Arts Luncheons is because the community committee of the Brooklyn Museum when the announcement was made in 2001 that there was going to be a Sackler Center for Feminist Art, the community committee decided that it was time to have a Women in the Arts luncheon. And they began the first luncheon, and that's why we are now into our 13th year. And I'd like to thank our history, which is the community committee and the women who, uh, who showed we stand on, who started this wonderful event. And, um, I want to thank also Leslie Puth again, one more time, and Carol Robinson again, one more time, and all of you for participating with us. Thank you. <laughs> Anne, Anne has already said what your matronage provides for us, and it provides for the incredibly pro progressive program that we do at the Sackler Center, as well as the public and educational programming that we do throughout the museum. And we have one other major event uh, that is connected to the Sackler Center. Um, this one is particularly connected to the Council for Feminist Art, and I thank all of the council members of, of the Feminist Art uh, group because it's been a tremendous uh, opportunity for all of us to get to know each other, and we have bonded and done some incredible work over the years, and also this award, this particular award is also part of the Board of Trustees of the Brooklyn Museum. But the Sackler Center First Award is uh, a Sackler Center First Award, and it's the fourth wing, the virtual wing, of the dinner party. And for those of you who may have been here last year, you know that we honored Miss Piggy. And for those of you who were there, here the year before, you know that we honored Anita Hill, and before then, Judy Tamar. And our fifth anniversary, we honored uh, 14 of the most astounding and wonderful women. And the fourth wing then becomes the women who would be on the dinner party if the dinner party was then in the 21st millennium. So you can see it actually in all of their bios um, up on the Sackler Center in the, in the forum. And I'm going to announce right now, and this you're getting a cut off my press. <laughs> is that June 2nd, mark your calendars, is going to be our uh, 2016 Sackler Center First Award. And we are presenting to the award, the award to D -D 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 -D, feminist, activist, academic for social justice, Angela Davis. <laughs> Thank you. For those of you who weren't alive when Angela was doing her do, you will learn. For those of you who were and thought you really understood what was going on, you might find out more than you knew. And it is going to be a very, very extraordinary event. We will be showing uh, a documentary on Angela, and she will be then in, um, in dialogue with the one and only and our favorite, Gloria Steinem. If, by the way, little plug here must be for Gloria. Gloria's new book is out, and it's called On the Road. And it is fan, as she would say, fan fucking tastic. <laughs> so if you haven't bought it yet, go out and get it. It is a great read. It will really fill in things that you didn't know. It's going to excite you about um, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how much more there is to do. So we are here, a hotbed of action, and uh, I invite you to join the Council for Feminist Art. This is kind of what we all do when we get together, and I hope you will consider that. Uh, Miami Basel is the next stop. And uh, today, we are here, uh, and it's an extraordinary pleasure for me that we are honoring Marina Abramovich. Um, it was a pleasure to meet her last year. I met her last year 
and we discussed many aspects of her work and also of her research. And she's in discussion today with Catherine Morris, the um, Sackler Family Curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Catherine, since 2010, when she arrived here, has curated 15 of our exhibitions. They have all been critically acclaimed and they have been very important additions to the artistic and social and theoretical dialogue of both feminist art and feminism and indeed world culture. And uh, if you don't know it already, our mantra is equal pay, equal wall space. <laughs> Marina Abramovich, since the beginning of her career in Belgrade during the early 1970s, Marina Abramovich has been a pioneer in performance art, creating some of the form's most important early works. The body has always been her subject and her medium. Exploring her physical and mental limits, she has withstood pain, exhaustion, and danger in the quest of emotional and spiritual transformation. I think for many women, we understand pain, exhaustion, and physical danger. <clears throat> Abramovich was awarded the Golden Lion for Best Artist at the 1997 Venice Biennale, and in 2008, she was decorated with the Austrian Commander Cross for her contribution to art history. In 2010, Abramovich had her first major US retrospective and simultaneously performed more than 700 hours in the exhibition the artist is present at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, of course, obviously. In 2014, she completed the three-month performance, 512 hours at the Serpentine Gallery in London. Abramovich founded the Marina Abramovich Institute, MAI, a platform for immaterial and long-durational work to create new possibilities for collaboration among thinkers in all fields. In 2015, the Institute realized its most complete form to date. Please join me in welcoming Marina Abramovich with Catherine Morris. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Anne and Elizabeth and Leslie and Carol. It's um, an honor to be sharing the stage today with Marina Abramovich. Um, and we have a series of slides that we're going to scroll through and talk about as we do or we don't in the conversation. And um, I thought in thinking about how to um, begin a conversation with Marina that I was curious after knowing Marina's work for decades um, to start at the beginning. You know, I feel like oftentimes when you interview an artist, you dive directly into the work, you get sort of the basic biography out of the back, out of the way immediately, but it, it seems to me that Rena's, your story is um, so integral and so appears so many ways in the work that I, I think the audience, and I know I would love to, to sort of start there. And um, the first place I thought I would start is that you have a birthday coming up at the end of this month. Everybody has a birthday once a year. Right. Everybody has a birthday once a year, but for a good number of years in your life, as I understand it, you thought your birthday was a different day than what it actually was. That's the story you want. <laughs> so anyway, and maybe we should start slides. Slides are just kind of background. We, we don't stop them. You know, or I just can comment maybe very fast. Uh, this is uh, where my family come from, which is from Montenegro. This is my mother and father, the both national heroes and partisans in Tito time, to be, you know, the parents of the, to be the, the, the daughter of the parents of national heroes is a hell, to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, this is my mother, my father, a soldier, and uh, my, you know, my father was general, my mother was major of the army, and then she became the director of the Museum of Art and Revolution. I was very broad, very strict. This is the first carnival when I was four years old. Everybody looks beautiful, but my mother dressed me as a devil, which I never understand, which I never understand why, you know? And I was very sorry and concerned. Look, the hair of my father is so well elaborated. He was a very handsome man and a difficult way to live. I was very proud of my father in this little photo. Again, I was, I think, age maybe four. 
And uh, here, I don't know, here I was 36, but everybody thinks I was 16. <laughs> and then I was very happy in this moment in my life. I was in nature, and the cut on my face was just uh, for the fire. I was trying to cook something. This is my mother, and the cap of my mother, which I wear. And I was started as a painting, and I was a painter. So, uh, I maybe don't comment any more slides, but tell you the story. The slides just go on. So, uh, I was born 30th of November, but my mother was always celebrating my birthday on 29. And 29 November is when the, uh, Tito, uh, you know, the, the president of um, ex Yugoslavia, uh, formed the country. And for that day, every child who was born on 29 November would go to Tito and get the presents and get candies and take photographs. It was a big day. And every time the 29 November came, I was not invited. And, and why? Because my mother was telling me that I was not good enough. And only much later I understood that actually I was never even born on 29, I was born on 30, and it was just a way of punishing me. So that's a nice little story, okay, from the beginning. Oh, you know, I didn't know the part about the punishment. I might not have started there. The punishment was Sorry. That, that, that you were never good enough. That I was never good enough. I always had to be better. And even if I was better than everybody else, I was still not good enough. But then you also, at one point when you moved to Amsterdam, you decided also to announce a different birthday. Is that accurate, or you? No, then I really find out that my birthday, I should celebrate my birthday. But I never liked it, because I was never comfortable with this birthday. So when I took Amsterdam, I met Ulai, who was my partner for 12 years. And uh, I met him on my birthday. And then, and I was, and he said, but this is my birthday too. I said, it's not true, I can't believe. But it was true, and we fall in love, and more 12 years, and separate the Great Wall of China, and everything became very dramatic, and so on, and so on. <laughs> this is what I <laughs> Actually, you can't divide my art, work and life. It's, everything is interrelated, that's true. And even the, the, be the beginning of your life, the, the sort of drama, politics, spirituality, because there's an important vein of spirituality, and you're running through your family as well. Oh, this was my incredible strong relation to my grandmother. You know, just to tell you, for an artist, it's very important, the biography. And my theory is, the worse biography and the worse childhood you have, the better artist you get. Because you have the material to work with. I mean, nobody makes work with pure happiness, because happiness is state. It's beautiful, you're happy, and you don't need to do anything. But when you really have trouble, dramas, uh, uh, difficulties, you know, then this is good material. And if you survive all that, then it's really even better. So I had a really difficult childhood. One of the things that you ask um, students is how they know they're an artist. You know, when I teach more than 25 years in different countries, in Bosa, in Paris, in, in Germany, in Japan, in Amsterdam, in you know, lots, of, lots of places also um, here in, uh, in America. And um, for me it was really important when students come to me to understand the really true and pure, and pure reasons why somebody wants to be an artist. And, uh, you know, and they will say to me, oh, I like to be an artist. But mostly the kids like to be rich and famous, which is the worst reason for somebody to be an artist. You, and I said to him, you can't become an artist. You, you can't actually say to yourself, I want to be an artist. Because art is like a breathing. You don't question yourself if you breathe or you're not. You have to breathe. So you don't question yourself when you wake up in the morning and you have all these ideas. And these ideas are, emerging and you need to realize them and you is stronger it's like a fever it's like you're obsessed you you can't do anything else as, as you don't question the the breathing this is the same way i don't question creativity so that means you're really an artist because you can't do any other way not because you want to come you just are but then there's another question if you're just an artist how you're a great artist or just an artist that's a whole different level of sacrifice that you have to make to step to the other category so when did you know you were an artist? Since always, I am. The, I am. I'm not marriage material. I'm the worst. I, I. I can't do anything else. I. I just do. I just work. I just mean. I think when I was, you know, I start doing drawings and paintings as ever. But then when I was 14 years old, I made my first painting exhibition. I paint my dreams because dreams was given to me, so it was easy. I dream and then I paint them. 
And with 14, I had my first show. And I was so jealous of Mozart because he made it with seven. You know, I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> and you signed your paintings. Oh, the signing was the worst part because I was so impressed by Picasso. So I was signing these horrible paintings with huge Marina, like, like Picasso. I was so actually ashamed of that. And my mother had them all, and when she died, you know, I, uh, I actually inherited them. And I'm just thinking how to burn them now because they're really bad. And, uh, but you and haven't then, burned them. And then, no, not yet. I'm, I'm just thinking to make some kind of conceptual work out of this. But then also, also the. Uh, you know, my mother, you know, because later on I started doing performances and my lots of work, I've been naked. And, uh, you know, when I, my mother died, I went to, to, you know, to clean the house and all this, and I found all my books. And, you know, this, I made lots of books. I made more like 56 of them. And the catalogs from different exhibitions, and some they are very big ones. And she re edited them. She actually took all the photographs where I'm naked. So the books of like uh, 600 pages will be 35. <laughs> this is the all new editions now. Of course she could not show them to the neighbors. <laughs> so you decided at some point you were you were painting and you decided you didn't like the studio. You didn't like being in a studio space. It's not like that. This was gradual. You know, I, I had the, you know, I was painting, I went to the you know the normal academy and study five years and do the two years post diploma and I really wanted to be a painter. But then you know I had a different kind of uh, part of playing paying my dreams. I was I was painting you know, truck accidents, and then I started playing clouds. And I was really obsessed with clouds. I was obsessed with universe. I was not interested more about universe itself, but it was always the big question was, what is behind universe? Are there multiplied universes? What is, what is behind all this? What is the meaning of life? I was always interested in these big, big questions. And I looked at the sky very often, and then I discovered all these clouds were coming and going, and projections, and black holes, and clouds were hitting the ground, and you know, I made all this theory of clouds. And I was lying on the, on the field in, in the countryside looking at the sky, and this particular moment was just blue sky, there was nothing there. And out of nowhere came 12 military, you know, the ultrasonic planes, and they made this boom sound. And you see how they make the drawing from the air, they pass. And then I saw this drawing being formed and then disappear and the blue sky again come. And it was for me like a spiritual revelation. I understand, I really remember very well this moment. I stood up from the, I stand up from the field and I said to myself, I will never go back to studio. I'm not going to do something two dimensional. When artists have this incredible freedom that we can do things from anything, from dust, from the, from earth, I can use the sound, I can use the, the fire, water, myself, whatever. And then I went to the military base and I asked if I can get 12 planes to make my own drawings in the sky. They called my father and said, get your daughter out of here, she's crazy. You know how much cost 12 military planes to make, to make the drawings for her in the sky? So they sent me home. But then I never really was interested in studio for me. Studio for me was a trap. I think that art comes from life. You have to do life. So you just to realize already ideas that you have from somewhere else. And that's how actually I started more my body and more and more in work. But you've had to be home at 10. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> so you would you started doing these radical performances and were invited to do them in galleries, but you still had to be home at 10 o'clock at night. You're, according to your mother, and so that's what you did. This is why I escaped home when I was 29. <laughs> and my mother went to police and said, you know, that the daughter is escaped home. And then they said, but what is her age? And then he said, 29. And he said, you know, Kamarad Abramovich, we have more important things to do. Can you just make <laughs> like, us about time that she leaves? <laughs> but I had to be ten, home then, always. So I was doing these performances, but you know, cutting communist style on the stomach or burning it in the, in the square. It was a big deal. And, um, and you know, my father and my mother being criticized in the Communist Party for about education. And my professors was, you know, thinking that I was ready to go to mental hospital. I was a complete black sheep and rebel from the beginning, from day one when I started working with the performance. But I could not give up. I really was thinking I'm in the right track. You know, performance, uh, just to maybe to tell to the public what I mean, what is the performance, because there's so many explanations, you know, and many artists have different statements. But, you know, the Vito Conchi, which is a great American artist, he gave this in the, in the early 70s, he said, 
um, body is the place where work can happen. And this is how came the, 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 the title, the body art. And I belong from this, in the 70s to this, this uh, group of the very you know, early body artists. And the body was the work, the blood was the, 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 the color, the, the tools I used on my body was the, you know, like, like a pen, pen, like, like a chisel or the, or, or the brush. So the body was the place where everything happened. And which is incredible, but performance is such a immaterial form of art. It's not like a painting, you come home and, you know, painting is there, you go to the museum, the next day this painting is still there. But here is a time-based art. If you're not there to see it, it's, it don't exist. And then when you see it, all what is there is your memory. And that's a really software, you know. So it's one of the most difficult, um, you know, the, the form of art that exists. And it's very hard to be there for a long time. So I'm thinking about some of the early pieces that you did before you um, formed your partnership with Ule, and one of the ones that I think stands out for many of us is Rhythm Zero. Is it Rhythm Zero or Rhythm O? Rhythm Zero, Rhythm O, whatever, Rhythm Zero. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a remarkable a piece that, um, would you like to describe it? Or? No, I love you to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll help me. I've done too many times. <laughs> um, the work is one in which, in a gallery, standing in a gallery in Naples in 1974, um, you laid out a selection of objects, range 76. 76, um, with sort of an attendant range of implications um, from a feather to a rose, to a uh, gun at the other end, with one bullet, not loaded. And one bullet is enough. One <laughs> bullet is more than enough. Um, and you stood in the gallery for six hours and invited the public to interact. To do whatever they want, even kill me. And I take all responsibility. Very simple. Very simple. Very dramatic. And um, what's fascinating, there's so many things that is fascinating about it, but what's so interesting about it in the telling of the story, as I've read it in numerous places, is you know, people started off gently, perhaps, and as time went on, and in the response to your passiveness, became more aggressive. Um, and in one of the interviews I saw with you, you said that, um, that the men were more aggressive, but they were often being told what to do by their wives who they brought with them. But also it was interesting, it was, inter you know, first of all, this performance came out of, out of reaction that I, in those days, in the 70s, performance artists was being so much attacked by the press and the public to say that masochists, they are sadists, they are um, they're exhibitionists, that this is not any kind of art, that this bullshit and so on. And I really wanted to see what would happen if I'm dressed, standing in the middle of the space of the, normal gallery and with these all objects the giving to the public possibility to see how far they can go, how far they can even go to kill an artist. And it was a really courageous thing. I was 23 and you know, 23 you do these things. And, uh, and you know, and also doing this in Italy. And in Italy it was really interesting because everything that we done to me, it was a reaction of the three actually iconic ideals in Italy. This was mother, the whore and Madonna. And it was like the three images that we, you know, the, the public were reacting. But also, the, in the beginning, nothing happened. Time is very important. In the beginning, you're just in a normal gallery, you do two, three things. But six hours is enough time that the people develop all kinds of emotions and aggressions. And I remember that, you know, they cut my clothes, they put a pin of rose in my body, they cut me on the neck, I still have a scar, drink my blood, they hold me around the gallery, put me on the table, put a knife between my legs. They didn't rape me because they was with their wives. And after six hours of my complete passivity, you know, the gallery say, you know, they, um, the performance is finished. I start walking towards them and I look like hell. I was full of blood and then, you know, half naked. And they just run away, every single one there. And I remember coming, you know, to the hotel, looking in my mirror, and I have a gray hair. I just piece of gray hair. And I knew the public can really kill you. So, which is really interesting, my relation to public change since then till now. Because if, the, if you can actually 
uh, get the worst out of the public or you can get the best out of the public. This was the real example of getting worse out of the public. And we are just looking right now, the artist is present, this is how you can elevate public spirit and how you can get actually best of the public. So I learned to deal with public in different ways. And what's so remarkable to me is that, that image of, that you just described of kind of what happens after the performance, that when you regain your personhood in a way and move towards these people, their instinct is to flee. No, they could not deal with me as a person because right. I was a passive element in the space and then become person. Well, and they were also probably feeling immediately it gets turned into guilt. Well, the next fear. day they call the gallery, they don't know what happened to them, why they put the bullet in the pistol, why they put it in my temple, why, I mean, there was so many questions because they actually got surprised by their own reaction. And did you have an expectation that this would happen? Is no, what you thought no, would happen? No, no, I, no, I, I never, you see, I never, the try the, the performance and I never um, you know the, the rehearse because if I rehearse any of these performances I will never do them because it was too difficult or too impossible you know for me one element that I have to count that I can push my limits of the body as far as I can I have to count of energy of the public the more public the more energy the better I can get because new energy is for me incredibly important as a performance artist or if I just deal with my own energy I don't have this kind of energy to do these things. It's very important. You know, in the beginning, we had the audience 10 people, 20, 30, and now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm having hundreds of thousands. It's such a huge difference. And what's also interesting to me about that is, so when you did your um, Seven Easy Pieces at the Guggenheim several years ago, um, you reenacted Valley Export's um, Action Pants, um, which, if you don't know, it is a, a famous performance that Valley Export um, performed in a movie theater in, um, in Berlin, I believe, um, in which she walked around a movie theater in a pair of crotchless black leather chaps um, holding a machine gun. Um, and she was a, a porno theater, I believe, and she would approach the men in the theater. Um, and you reenacted a photograph of her that was taken afterward where she's sitting in a chair with her legs spread, sort of holding the gun in her lap. And seven hours. Seven hours. Guggenheim. In the Guggenheim with hundreds of people, as you said, but it's in, in that experience, too, people, I think, again, because of the passivity, because you were willing to sit there, people did get a little bit aggressive again. And you also did made the decision, and I'm sorry, but um, not to enact the action, but to enact the photograph. And you said with some knowledge that you didn't want the aggression. But the important thing is the context of why I got these seven easy pieces. I done seven easy pieces as a very action to um, a young artist and everybody else was copying the artist from the 70s without giving any kind of um, credits to the original material. And even young critics will prize the young artist doing the, the stuff that already the, the older artists did, saying that it was original, it was unique, and so on. And then the performance art was also copied by the, by the fashion, by the, the, the MTV industry, by the theater, the, the, um, even the you know, design, um, all kinds of different, you know, they would, and they would take the images, they would kind of change them and actually never give credit to original work. So I was thinking, I need, a, as in one of the, actually almost, I don't know, anybody my age is still performing, basically, nobody. <laughs> so I was still, you know, I wanted to put some kind of order in this whole thing. So I asked, um, I, uh, I asked um, uh, to perform. The, the classical pieces of performance art, but I never saw them myself, but I want to experience them. I asked permission, with Valley Export, I asked permission for her to do this piece, pay for permission, and uh, you know, and do my own version, but always mention the original material. But you know, Valley Export, context of her work was really important, because she came from Vienna, and this was at the time in the late 60s and early 70s, with Viennese axionism, like Hermann Nietzsche, Inter Proust, uh, Otto Mühl, all these people was working, and there was no space for the woman artist to, to be there. And she was really fighting just this kind of macho thing there, on the top and doing incredible strong radical pieces. And the one piece with called genital panic, with opening her vagina and with the machine gun, it was such a strong image. And I felt that this image can actually live through different times. And I asked her, and she was very willing and happily told me, yes, you can perform this piece, which I did. Um, and you also performed Seedbed. Conscience, yes. <laughs> no comments on this. <laughs> it's too complicated to explain. 
So, but it does raise the issue, which is, I think, important also of um, how you feel about, so in the experience of the Guggenheim, um, you re reperformed five other people's performances. Yeah, I've yeah, Bruce Nauman and Vita Conchi and uh, the, the, the Joseph Boyce, the Gina Plane, and um, the Bali Export, and then two of my pieces, one old piece and I make a new piece. But it was really, I actually wanted so much to perform Chris Burden, the transfix, but when he's uh, actually crucified with the golden nails on, on the back of Volkswagen. And I asked him for so many times the permission, and he actually uh, never answered my letters, never gave me permission. And later on, you know, when he was live, I asked him, but why you never want to give me permission? And he said, why you ask me permission? Everybody's copying my work anyway. And this, he missed the point. I didn't want to do something that to copy his work. I want the permission because to me, if performance art is a living form of art, and if you don't reperform, it's just a dead image in a, in a, a bad video, you know, as a, in history. And I think that even if you put your own personality, even if you put your own charisma, change something, still is life. Marta Graham, as, as, as a, the, she also had a lot of promise to give permission to people to perform her dance. But performance have to be performed. And I have lots of my, my uh, contemporary who are totally against this idea. This was my work, nobody can touch it. And I think it's a question of ego. I give permission to everybody to perform my work except the one who is in danger of their life. I don't want to be responsible to make the, their life in danger. But the rest of the work, I, I give it. And I think this is the way how the work can live and have different and new lives. And you couldn't re-perform Rhythm Zero at the Guggenheim because they America, pistol, gun, are you crazy? <laughs> okay, just to tell you how difficult it's here. You know, some of the major pieces of, of, the, of the performance art is done in Europe because there's much less restriction here. Everything is restricted here. I mean, I remember a luminosity piece when you sit in the bicycle in the moment, the work I, I ask the different artists to re-perform. But just uh, like a day before performance came, six lawyers said to me, okay, uh, this piece has to be performed with the helmet, safety belt, and only 15 minutes, which I did originally six hours. And, and I signed the, the, the release that, that if anything happened, I, they, I have to pay one million or something. I, I signed so many of these releases. I would be completely bankrupt in prison if anything happened. But thanks God didn't. So what was it like having this incredible experience of having other people re-perform your pieces for your own retrospective? That's sort of the flip side of that yeah, discussion. It's really incredible. I just, uh, just now in China, uh, the, the, the Chinese artists re-performed the, the, the 12 different Chinese girls performed the work, Art Must Be Beautiful, Art Must Be Beautiful, in Chinese and English. It was amazing. It's, it's like you see the life of work. You see the work is this life. And the one thing that I am very proud of myself that uh, that I really have young audience. I have audience. I have the I have letters in, in my email boxes from the kids 14, 16, 17, who really follow the work, and especially the new arrangement of the new work I'm doing. You know, in in, in this serpentine gallery, 512 hours, I work directly with the public. So when you come to the gallery, you have to put in the lockers your, your telephone, your watch, your computer, and then you get a pair of headphones, and the pair of headphones completely block the sound. So the kid of 16 years old put the telephone in the locker, come to the space, put his headphones, then he looked at me and said, but they don't work. But of course they don't work, it's about silence. But this kid never had silence in his entire life. If he put headphones, he's listening to something. So he's introduced to the silence for the first time. And this is incredible. So I started kids bringing the children, their friends and other friends. It became this huge public of the kids listening silence. And this is really something I'm proud of. It. <laughs> Do you think that started with the Mama Show? The Mama Show, it's, it's another thing. It's, you know, change also everything. The, the, the Mama Show changed. You know, I've been really criticizing this whole idea of the passing through the normal artist as kind of celebrity. But it looks like the, it's, it's, it's my fault. I didn't do anything. It's the public fault that they put me there. And, and I, just the, the, the amount of people change. It's not even more art public. But it's lots of people, different culture, different backgrounds, different education, not even interested in art. There is something there that is touching people in a different way. Because I understood the need of the public. Public in the 70s was a normal, passive public. They look things on the stage, what happened. But now the public need more. They don't need to look at something. They need to be part of something, and I'm giving them that. You have, and you've given them an introduction to 
going back to the 70s, the idea of duration, the idea of sticking with something <clears throat> for hours on end or for six hours at a time. And I think that that's a very unusual experience for, for most of us. To me, a long duration thing is the, is the something, you know, let's say if I die like tomorrow, what will happen? I think that if I will be remembered for a few things, I will remember to introduce re-performance that you can re-perform and leave the piece. Look at this family. That's all three generations with the headphones blocking the sound, standing for hours there, just by themselves. This is 512 hours. This is where the public actually come to be with themselves. This little kid, it was an incredible story. He was coming every day and asked, him, and he just stand there. And, as, and with his headphones, and I said, but why are you coming every day? He said, you know, it's really important. I was going so bad in school. Now I go to my room, and before anything I start, I still stand still in the middle room with the headphones listening to silence. And then I can do everything. And, and, and he, was, he was 12. I mean, 12 years old. So that's, there is a need of some other kind of understanding. You know, before this kind of reaction with the public, it was not possible, the public was not ready for this, nobody was ready. But now, our life is so fast. We are in, living in such a stress that life is getting shorter and shorter. Art had to go longer and longer. This is why long duration work is so important. Not just for the artists have to get into the state of mind, but also for the public to get to the same state of mind. We need time. We need time without technological interruption. One of the things that I also heard you talk about was after the Serpentine piece, that you, you know, this, uh, this taking away of props, to go back to that earlier piece, the sort of taking away of things, which actually ends up in a strange way becoming very Baroque in your, in, in your hands, which is, I think, sort of interesting. You know, this is what you say, removing props. That's really important. You know, when you're a young artist, you are insecure, so you need lots of things. You need the uh, slide projections and music, and you need this, uh, this uh, prop, and you need that prop, and your costume, whatever. But the more you understand, the performance is all about energy. It's all about me and you. It's all about this. It's all about, you know, being in the present, standing here. And you don't need anything. You just need to establish energy dialogue. And it's all what happened. I mean, let's do it one minute. Just, just be with your mind and your body, here and now, and that's it. Many souls just pass through the mind doing this moment. Are we, anybody here can have the mind that is still and with no thinking and just being in here and now moment, which is the only reality we are ever going to have. The, we always in the past, which happened already, or in the future, it didn't happen. But the only reality, the only thing that we can absolutely be sure that we exist is in the present. Because next second, the whole ceiling can fall down. Asteroid could hit this planet and we all dead. We don't have a future and past happen. Present is the only, only reality. And we are so little in that present. We are doing everything to not to be in the present. And the performance which I'm trying to do is to lift human spirit through the moment of presence. Wow, this is deep. Okay. <laughs> I'm also funny. <laughs> well, so I find that incredibly difficult. Did anybody else find that difficult? Just sitting here for a minute as a group? This is why you need the time. You see, this is why you need counting the rice, which I'm, which I'm, which I'm proposing to people. Counting the rice is essential. You have this rice and lentils. And you have to separate right in lentils and you have to count separately in another. And this process can take like anything between three, four, five, six hours. 
And you have to, before you count rice, you have to decide what you're going to do. Are you going to just separate lentils and rice, and that's it? Or are you just going to separate lentils and rice and only count lentils, or only count rice, or you decide to do everything? That decision you have to make in the front of it, it's very important. It's like life. If you, if you give up in the middle, you can't do life either. This is the old thing, you know? And in the process of counting lentils and rice, is so many things can happen. You, you go crazy. You, in the beginning, it's interesting and amusing, then you get bored, then you, you lose patience, then you say, what, what if she's absolutely out of her mind, what are you doing this here? Then you start breathing because you get angry, and then time passes and time passes, and you're getting more and more calm. And because of that repetition, your body getting the same amount of oxygen, and same amount of oxygen goes into every atom of your cell. And you become quieter, the breathing become quieter, and you need time to that, to that stillness, and then you're in presence. So the counting lies is just a tool. So that's the one another performance of Gina Panin is um, seven hours lying there. So she originally made this performance 28 minutes, but I add time to every single piece I did. So I made it seven hours each of these performances, one after another, seven days. And apparently that was also one of the few times you, I don't know if this is the correct terminology for it, for it but sort of broke character in a performance because you... Like Joseph Boyce, this one. Mm -hmm. That was a crazy piece because first his wife said no, but no for me is just the beginning. So I went to, I went to, I went to this sort of, and I, said, and I stand there on the door and I said, because Kogan have said permission, you know, the, the letters that we want permissions and so on. And then she said always in the letter, no, no, no. And this is this is called the piece is called how to explain to dead hair art. And um, and then I went to the I went to the to her home and was the same I was in the suitcase in the front of her door in the, in the middle of the winter. She opened the door and said, Frau Abramovich, my answer is no, but you can have coffee. I said, can I have a tea? And five hours later I had permission. But uh, which was it was a complicated piece. It was lots of fun because that hair, because of the protection of animals, have to die natural death. So this hair was dead on the highway in Texas, and, and by the plane, completely frozen. Wait, that me. was one of the criteria for the hair. Yeah, yeah, it had to be dead natural death. So he was hit by car. If this is natural death, anyway. So he was hit Did by. Did you car. have people out in the world? Well, there was no research. It was, so this was really, really safe. He was dead, and he was. Was, you know, hit by a car, frozen, and then by plane from Texas, he arrived in the morning. So I'm holding him, and then during seven hours, he freezes, and then become problem. But never mind. That's the best thing. <laughs> so that piece was in guy I done originally one hour, and I done seven hours. You see, I done one hour this piece when I was 24, 25, and when I was 65, I done all these pieces seven hours, which is so much more difficult. So people say to me. You know, I didn't have this wisdom and the will, uh, concentration, power which I have now. I, you know, it's that the body is, is giving up, but the actual willpower is stronger, so you can do pieces longer and more tougher than you've done when you're young. Even though you look the young, which was spectacular because, you know, blood all over the place. But this is easy because you have peace one hour and you have, then you, you can rest for, you know, months. But if you do something three months, it's a life. Like That's walk so the Great Wall of China. Like Wall of China, where this is present. You know, everybody say we Wall of China. You know, I work, you know, with this part for 12 years, and then we decide that they separate the Wall of China. And I remember William Defoe. He said to me, "Why you just don't make phone call? It's so easy." <laughs> so, what are Why you? Maybe don't ask audience. Three questions, I love, but only three questions, no more. Anybody have something to, to ask me? You can ask anything, I, I can answer anything. Anybody? Yes? Is there anything you regret doing? Wow, that's an interesting question. <laughs> the question was, is there anything you regret doing? I actually don't, because I never looked the past. You know, everything had the reason why things are happening. Even in the worst experience, even the things that I made wrong decisions in my life, I will still do them again. Because they are the reason why things are happening. You know, I'm more and more interested in how I can live my life in synchronicity. That I am here in the, when you are in the moment, things happen in kind of fluid, and, 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 you know, without obstacle way. But when you resist, 
then, then you really have problems. So I done things that I actually was huge mistakes I done, but I done it, I done them, and I learned from them. And if I didn't do them, I would not learn from them. So it's okay. I, I, you have to do everything you wanted to do. The, the idea of freedom, it's very important that you know that you have this freedom as an artist that you can make work out of nothing. You know, how, the performance is literally about energy, and it's nothing. It's, it's just there, that's it, and to tap to that energy. And you have to do this by going through the really bad experiences. And the most important is failure. Failure in everybody's life is important. You have to learn to fail. Because if you don't go to the territory you've never been, and experimenting and be curious, you, you are always doing the same thing over and over again. And you're repeating yourself, and your life is boring. But if you do things you don't know, and the things that are mystery and the things that are exciting, you can may fail because how you can know what is another side. So the failure is very important. You have to fail many times in your life. Okay, second question. Yeah. When you were telling a story about um, walking away after these people that assaulted you, such, I felt that. I'm not sure I could uh, recover from something that emotional. What was your sense of it all after? Were you able to kind of separate yourself? It's a good question. You know, it's really important to understand the mind of an artist who is a private person and the mind of an artist in the performance. Because, you know, I have this, uh, this uh, the kind of statement, the, the kind of, uh, let's say, the, the, yeah, it's a statement, what performance is. Performance is mental and physical construction, which an artist step in, in, a, in, the, in the precise time and space in the front of audience, and then energy dialogue is happening. So this is a shift. You go from your simple self, you know, little Marina self who cry if she cut cucumber and then she a pain on the finger, but another Marina who can do anything in the stage because she's using audience energy. And that Marina is a different Marina. And then when performance step, you go into this other, you know. So from that Marina you can do anything. You can even die. But then comes the other Marina. Another Marina doesn't connect with that trauma. It's, it's different because that one is the performing Marina. You know, this is like you really shift into another in another reality. I mean, I, I, I this is I learned this so much from the from the Tibetan Buddhists, from the shamans in Brazil that I study, from the different ancient cultures. When they do ceremonies, they go into that different state of mind, which everything is possible because become they become divinity. Every mask which shaman have on his head in that state of the of the of the the mind when he is presenting certain divinity, he is limitless. But the moment he takes his mask, this is this old man that he can't even jump or walk. So that kind of shift of energy is happening with the performance. And then, when, and then you know, the more the shift you make, the performance gets better because you are not yourself. You're not your ordinary self. You are functioning from the highest self possible. You know, it's 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 also a funny example. You know, sometimes you meet a you meet a writer, and you, first you read a great great book, and you say, "Oh my God, I have to meet the writer." And you go to meet the writer, and writer is in the bar. He's unshaved. He didn't wash himself for 20 days. He drinks like hell, and he speaks total rubbish, and he's crazy. And you could not absolutely identify that the same writer can write this sublime book. How is this possible? Because when you write a book, this is the best of income scene. This is like giving birth. And then you go to the ordinary self. Sometimes ordinary self is not pleasant at all. Okay. Third question. <laughs> yes. You talked about failure and how artists have to fail. But what does failure look like to you? What does that mean? Different things, you know. I, I mean, I made some performances in my life that are so bad that you could not even believe. And, <laughs> and, and, and the public was there and I was doing them and I said, what? The hell I was thinking and I could not stop and it was getting worse and worse and then I stopped and I had a terrible you know the migraine attack and then fever and I don't go out for months home because I'm shamed you know that's the failure but I had to experience I have to see to the other side you know then my failure with, uh, with my you know in my private life I could not succeed to 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 have a you know home children uh, you know sit and eat uh, pullovers for my husband or you know just be normal 
I mean, don't worry. I try so so much, but I can't. That's the work, and I'm still thinking maybe one day, but who knows? And you know, it's lots of failures. You know, it's failures that you go to, to you see things, you go to certain trips, you 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 you're getting some ideas, and they're not good, and they're you know falling apart. And but you still wanted to have this process, and you wanted to know what is another side. But you don't know about the failure in the beginning. You have to first get to the journey to know what is on the end. So you can't just have, you know, any any kind of um, there is no there is no rules at all. This was three questions. I have three questions. You know, I have this story about three questions because if you go to Sweden or these countries then don't talk at all. So you ask them three questions and then they really answer because because if you ask them seven then they can't deal with seven. But then three is <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the three questions, and thank you, Marina. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for philosophy. Thank you for identifying uh, the restrictions that we live with, and for giving us the courage to face them and to move forward. Thank you very much. So, on behalf of the Brooklyn Museum and the Council for Feminist Art, I would like to give this award for the Arts 2015. Thank you so much. I'm really touched by this award. I'm touched by many different reasons. You know, this is 45 years later, 45 years of real struggle that I put all my energy and my, my um, work into this idea that performance has become the mainstream art. It's never been mainstream art. It's been so much, uh, you know, time that photography and video was uh, also not mainstream art, but became. But performance was always this kind of nobody category. We was always doing <coughs> everything. It was even even getting the, the 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 letter and saying, "Oh, we are doing opening. Can you do performance for the opening?" It was like an idea of entertaining, stand-up comedy, but not understand really how performance can have transformative force. How the performance can really change not just performing the the, the, the life of, of the artist, but also the other people's lives. And when this happened. And when I get this kind of reward, it means that, that it's just, this world is not just for me. This world is for the all young artists who are coming and having the same struggle. And I kind of, you know, I wanted to clear the path. I wanted to make it easy. So if I can make it, they can make it too. And really be in touch. And I just want to say that I am very uh, sentimental today because I'm realizing that in 1970, Nine, I was performing. The first performance I made in America was in here in Brooklyn Museum, exactly 36 years ago. And it was a really, and this performance was made with Ulai and was dedicated to the Golden Mata Club, which was at that time the dying artist. And I remember this very well. So coming here and being here with all of you and getting all these memories, it's a long time. And uh, I really like to thank Ivana Pasternak and uh, all of you and Sacre Foundation for this award and all my office. And uh, the West, uh, Alison Bernard, who is here, and, and uh, Giuliano Rizziano, all the people who work with me. Because, you know, doing performance, you have to have, a, it's not just come from yourself. It's, it's a huge group teamwork. Thank you.